Is this on? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Heidi Schmalbach. I am the program director of Planet Texas 2050. So grateful that all of you are here today. This is the second day of our annual research symposium. Um, we're kicking off with a, a series of lightning talks, um, two blocks today and tomorrow. Today we have 11 talks from scholars at all different levels uh, of their careers, from students to, to full professors representing um, different departments all over the, the University of Texas at Austin campus. Um, on Thursday, we'll also have practitioners. Um, we're starting off the day on Thursday with a panel um, in conjunction with the City of Austin Office of Sustainability. There's all sorts of things going on um, over the next couple of days. If you check out our, our full schedule, um, you'll see videos that are set up in each of the rooms behind us. Um, one room has our uh, flagship research team's 2022 updates, so if you have a little bit of time and you want to check that out and see what those teams have been up to, you can sit and, and relax and do that. In another room, we have student-led um, experimental films from uh, Katie McCarthy, an instructor in the uh, core studio classes, has, has taught her what semester is it? Spring 2022 uh, classes around Plant Texas 2050 themes. You'll also see their artwork set up all around um, the Glickman Conference Center. And if you check out the maps in the uh, lobby, we have a virtual reality experience along Waller Creek set up. Um, there'll also be another VR demo right after this block of lightning talks in the room straight across the hall. And immediately after the lightning talks, we will have what we're calling Resilience Cafe, which is an on-brand way of describing a, a diffused Q&A. So we encourage everybody to grab coffee. There'll be pastries set up, take time to talk to each other, ask questions of the presenters from this afternoon, take some time to talk with our researchers and learn about what they're doing. Um, if you have any questions, you can find me or one of my colleagues, you've probably already met Loida in the green overalls, um, and we can answer any questions that you have. We're really excited that you're here, and thank you for taking the time to participate in our symposium. And with that, I will kick it off with Jessica Jones. Let me tell you two presenters. I will be your wrap it up timekeeper. I'll sit right there, so I'll let you know when you've got two minutes left of seven minutes, and then this is your cue. I'll wave it up and down when it's time to wrap it up. Everybody loves this job. Um, Jessica, do you wanna come on up? Yeah. Thank you all again. Do you know how to turn me on? Is it on? <laughs> do I need both? No, no. Okay. <laughs> For the audience. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica Jones, and I'm a dual graduate student here at UT in the Public Affairs and School of Architecture in Community and Regional Planning. So today, we'll get to dive into a little bit of my thesis research on neighborhood emergency preparedness. So throughout the US, there's been an increase in severity and intensity of natural disasters. In addition, there's a decline in career emergency professionals. In their 2018-2022 strategic plan, FEMA noted that their, the government-centric approach to disaster management is not enough. It's time to involve the community in emergency response efforts. So in this talk today, we'll get to go over some of my thesis research on neighborhood emergency preparedness, and we'll be exploring these research questions. First, how does it work? What are the common barriers and challenges? And are the programs derived from a perception of risk or uh, social vulnerability? And now for our first case study. The city of Seattle has a population of around 740,000 residents and a median household income of $134,000. In 2020, there was a reported poverty rate of about 10%. The Seattle Emergency Hub Network is a community-led and community-created program to harness what will come naturally during an emergency event, neighbors helping one another. What is a hub? 
Most simply, it's a group of organized residents around emergency preparedness efforts and a box of emergency supplies to help the hub function located in a communal open space in the neighborhood area. Hub trainings are available online, and during these trainings, hub organizers stress that household emergency preparedness is the groundwork for neighborhood emergency preparedness and for hubs to run effectively. And during these trainings, hub organizers stress that volunteers seek out and practice community drills, as well as seek out other trainings. This is an example of what a hub can look like, and this is a hub box. Um, when activated, hubs become service areas for neighborhoods, and they are staffed by 12 volunteer positions, from a resource coordinator to an information manager to an education officer. Together, these volunteers help residents in finding missing loved ones during emergency events, be, uh, identifying educational resources that will help them navigate the emergency in a safe and effective way, as well as matching resource needs with resource wants. Currently, there are 66 activated hubs throughout the city of Seattle, and while more continue to develop, there are some challenges to note. These challenges include navigating city relations, as well as identifying enough funding to support this effort. City staff view community hubs, or view the hub network, as a community-grown thing. And while this is positive, there's some perception that this could be fleeting. Another perception is that while the hub network is mentioned in city emergency resources, city staff are still struggling on how they will actually work with hubs during an actual emergency event. Funding-wise, because it's grassroots, uh, they've been primarily, the hub network has been primarily funded by community members. And this limited budget makes it really difficult to conduct outreach. And now for our next case study. The city of LA has a population of around 3.9 million people, almost 4 million, and a median household, household income of $65,000. And as of 2020, a reported poverty rate of about 15%. The Ready Your LA Neighborhood Program, or RYLAN, is the city's primary program for household and neighborhood emergency preparedness efforts. It's a free 90-minute training, usually run by city staff, that covers everything from how to create a neighborhood response plan, a skills and inventory list, as well as a contact list for your neighborhood. And after this training, staff create a map of your neighborhood area for the residents to use, and residents are encouraged to practice community drills with one another. Currently, there are 200 neighborhoods that have been gone through the Ryland training. And while this is a major feat, there are again some challenges to note. These challenges include staffing as well as navigating community trust. The city of LA has only dedicated four employees to run this program, four employees to oversee the organization and education of about four million residents. It's unwieldy. Secondly, navigating community trust. City staff recognized that Residents may not want to provide sensitive information to the city, which could include contact information and household disability challenges. So the program was actually designed to house and keep that information locally within the neighborhood. So today we're, we've learned about two case studies, the Seattle Hub Network and the Ready Your LA Neighborhood Program. Whether it be grassroots bottom up or top down city led, these case studies illustrate that neighborhood emergency preparedness can work and can function from either direction. Um, what we also learned from these case studies is that both programs derived from a perception of risk. The City of LA program came from the city's resilience plan and the Seattle Hub Network came from community discussions after the Nisqually earthquake and major wind storms. Finally, by engaging residents in this work, we can, quote, have them serve as community emergency messengers, as the hub network organizers did throughout the pandemic and during the 2021 heat wave. 
So my recommendations to the city of Austin to improve emergency preparedness efforts at the local level is to look into this hub model. It's much more sustainable to grow and empower and cultivate residents to create emergency preparedness efforts that work for their neighborhood rather than rely on a handful of staff to educate a large city and organize a large city on these efforts. Additionally, in working with community residents, city staff should help develop low tech easy to understand emergency preparedness materials. For example, with the hub network, anybody can be a hub volunteer as long as they're able to follow the materials in the hub box. Additionally, hub materials were created with the understanding that during an emergency event, Wi-Fi might, might not be available. So having materials that cover that basis. Finally, we should look into practicing neighborhood emergency preparedness drills. When we practice together, we learn together. Well, thank you for listening to my talk, and I was so excited to kick off the lightning talks today. All right, ready? All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Norris, and I am Assistant Professor of Practice in Library and Archives Conservation and Preservation um, at the School of Information here at UT. Um, in my role on faculty, I teach preservation and collections care for library and archives materials. Um, these are original physical materials, books, documents, and photographs. So my work spans among varied disciplines, uh, such as material science, conservation treatment, and preventive care. One of the most tangible applications of this work is my class, Disaster Planning and Response, where we grapple with the growing risks of climate change. Now, the cultural heritage conservation field is not new to disaster planning. In fact, much of our modern practice was born in a 1966 flood in Florence, Italy, when the Arno River broke its banks and submerged millions of books, manuscripts, and documents. This event was one of the first times that conservators began to grapple with salvage at scale, as seen here in the thousands of rare books Seems like we're off, as seen here, in the thousands of rare books covered in mud and drenched by the Florence floodwaters. This photo, photo shows just a portion of the damage at just one of many impacted institutions. This is the Biblioteca Nacional uh, or the National Library. Today, my students practice hands-on response techniques that have grown from those used in Florence. In this image, students are salvaging wet books in our teaching lab. But as students learn, salvage is an intensive process. And with climate change, the increasing scale of disasters continues to be our challenge. To address this, we're turning to risk mapping as a modern tool for collection stewardship. Each semester, my students use ArcGIS software to map climate risks like sea level rise and hurricane storm surge. We map this with locations data for Texas archives, compiled by the Society of American Archivists Repository Data Project. Students profile institutions that may be in harm's way, and they make proactive recommendations, large and small. For our collecting institutions, Students typically recommend good preservation fundamentals, such as improving storage materials and practices, 
prioritizing items for salvage, and training staff through regular tabletop exercises and hands-on drills. For our professional organizations and regional consortia and national funders, students advocate bigger changes, like pursuing major infrastructure projects, such as the coastal barrier known as the Ike Dyke, modernizing the state power grid, and even making the difficult decision to move collections permanently to safer ground. In this project, students really get to use their climate anxiety productively. They have great ideas, and I hope that they'll take some of these ideas into their future careers as archivists, librarians, and collections managers. And this project is growing. We're looking to engage with the complex flood modeling initiatives from Planet Texas 2050 to make our climate risk mapping more nuanced and accurate. I'm also planning a collaborative project with UT's Historic Preservation Program in Architecture to design modular storage that facilitates temporary collections moves during times of risk. And I'm hoping to work with some of you too. Please reach out if you'd like to be part of this important work of preserving our cultural heritage for the future. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here and listening to our presentation today. Um, the title of our project is Fostering Green Entrepreneurialism. Our project is a comparison of water practices and behaviors in Jordan and Texas. We were funded through the President's Award for Global Learning um, this past year. So central um, to this research project um, was this question, how can university campuses best contribute to sustainability and water conservation? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Abby, and like Tanya, we have two other undergraduate students on our team, Sumaya and Kisara. Um, we also have a faculty team of um, three faculty leaders and then a graduate uh, student assistant. And um, we've got quite an interdisciplinary team to tackle an interdisciplinary problem. Um, across the eight of us, we span six colleges at UT. Um, so a lot of different perspectives to take into account. Um, through the course of our project, uh, we really found that the main problem we are trying to solve is the fundamental lack of collaboration between higher education institutions to not only pursue, but also document and exchange sustainability efforts. Um, across different campuses. So we found that the solution we can take is to encourage more student-led sustainability initiatives, and we can also do our own analysis on um, our campus and other campuses to see what those initiatives may be. So why universities and why Jordan? We realized that a number of our faculty and undergraduate members had ties to the Middle East, whether it was language expertise or regional focus. Um, and, the, and at Jordan, we realized that about 63% of the population was under the age of 30 years old. So it was a really young population, and naturally, universities are microcosms of issues that we face in society, so we realized that universities um, would be the best place to conduct our research. In addition, we um, realized that about um, UJ and UT have 50,000 students each, and the University of Jordan is one of the leading research institutions in the Middle East. So we've been working on this project for two years. We started in April 2020, and to really tackle down um, those two years, we've identified three project phases. Um, phase number one is our qualitative data analysis. So that's our cross-cultural sustainability an um, analysis. 
Um, we pursued that at both universities by looking at focus groups and surveys to see what students feel towards sustainability. Um, phase two is the establishment of a green innovation fund at the University of Jordan. Um, and the idea was to use the results from phase one to inform what we would do in phase two of the project, what's important to the students at UJ and what projects should get funded. Um, and then phase three was that facilitation of knowledge exchange between both universities. Um, we did that in a variety of ways. The main way was we hosted a sustainability symposium at the University of Jordan, um, featuring speakers from both universities about water and energy conservation efforts at both universities. So at the heart of our project was the data uh, collection piece. Uh, this was done before and during our time in Amman, Jordan. Um, we utilized both surveys and focus groups. Uh, both surveys were sent to about 250 students in Austin as well as in Amman. Um, we were able to compare the findings um, of these um, surveys. Um, we tested their knowledge about sustainability in terms of definitions, and then we also wanted to touch on their opinions, attitudes, and beliefs about sustainability. Um, so we realized that UT students um, scored higher on questions of sustainable living and definitions versus U UJ students were drawn to perceptions of efforts and effort and consumption. Um, of course, there are some questions that weren't applicable to both populations uh, about environmental justice, race, um, but we found a way to format um, the survey for both populations. Um, so our focus groups were conducted um, prior to leaving to Amman. Um, there were about 45 to 60 minutes. Um, we utilized both visual and textual results. Um, of course, we asked questions um, to the students and documented that, but we also asked them to draw out their opinions and perceptions towards sustainability and what they felt towards that. UT students often drew or talk, talked about um, formal education, consumption, and um, responsibility to the environment versus Jordanian students um, were more keen to talk about the connection to nature that we have, innovation in the field, and renewable energy. So as you can see, this is one of the key questions we asked in our survey of the following, which would be the be considered living in the most environmental sustainable way. So you can take a look at the orange and the light blue. Um, um, just because of the net household consumptions in the United States and in Jordan, Jordan it's about $7,000 versus in the United States about $40,000. Um, UT students really wanted to reduce complete consumption of all products versus UJ students were leaning towards buying more eco-friendly products. Um, and key takeaways from phase two of the projects, that's the Green Innovation Fund. Um, we were successful in hosting our first iteration of the competition in November and awarded these three projects um, grants for the first GIF, Green Innovation Fund. Um, the first place was ADACT, which they developed their own proprietary machine learning algorithm to detect water leakages in the hotel, hotel space. Then there's SW Squared, and um, they have been able to connect the Arduino system to smart sensors, um, I guess improving agricultural yield and minimizing water loss in agricultural space. And the third one is Recycle of CO2, which is a research project um, where they're trying to build a filter to turn CO2 into useful organic matter like fertilizer. Um, or the, over the co course of the two years, um, you know, we got eight people on, on our UT team. We have eight people on our UJ team, so there's bound to be a lot of um, key challenges to occur. We've really boiled it down to this. Um, logistical issues, cultural differences, and everyone's favorite, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm happy to say that despite the challenges we did face, um, and even though our project looked very different now than it did two years ago, we are still able to achieve all the deliverables that we initially set out. So looking to the future, our next steps um, really are focused on funding the three project winners, not just financially, but also connecting them with different resources at UT. Um, we also want to continue to work on our deliverables um, and then make this an annual UJ um, Green Fund Innovation Fund. Um, of course, this has already opened a lot of doors between UT and UJ, and we want to continue on that and then continue to present and communicate our work. Uh, thank you so much um, for this presentation, for allowing us to present here and keep up to date yeah. with us. Thank you, guys. Yeah.
Hi, y'all. My name is Aurora Berry. I'm from the Drag Audio Production House over at the Moody College of Communications. I'm in my third year of my undergraduate degree at Moody, and I'm here today to talk to you about my work in the Artist in Residency program uh, through podcasting and our Planet Texas podcast. So we're going to go through a little summary of what you should be expecting from us here in the summer, as well as my own experience as a young person working in climate communication. So first things first, I'm going to go ahead and explain what our podcast is. So we work in collaboration with Planet Texas 2050 to tell stories of Texas resilience in the face of extreme weather, climate change, and population growth. So what we're doing here is we're taking this strong scientific backbone of Planet Texas 2050 research and we're giving it a human story. So that means that we're going into areas that have seen extreme weather events, natural disasters, and generally pretty devastating changes due to climate change and population growth. So what we do is we go into these communities and we talk to just regular folks who have been impacted by the things that we're studying here at the university. And what that means for us is that we're talking to people who might not necessarily have a great grasp on what climate change even is, yet they're the people on the front lines who are being impacted by it the very most. So the places that we've been looking specifically are at the Onion Creek neighborhood in Austin, Texas, which has frequently experienced flooding and has been also hit with the double whammy of gentrification. Um, we've gone into Bastrop County, where I'm from, which uh, in 2011, due to extreme drought, had one of the worst wildfires in Texas history and is just now starting to fully recover from that. We're also going into the Texas Panhandle to discover how small farmers are being crushed by the depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, we are also going in and talking about the February blackouts, which was one of the first times that many people in Texas experienced a natural disaster that truly shook their belief in the infrastructure core of our state. Um, and finally, we're going into Houston to talk about the extreme hurricane, Hurricane Harvey, and the ways that that impacted the communities in that area. So the best part about all of this is that going into reporting, this sounds obviously like a major bummer, right? Um, but then what we've discovered is that time and time again, we're seeing these stories of resiliency, of hope, of neighbors caring about neighbors, and all in all, a resistance to this overwhelming feeling of climate doom. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what the drag does. So the drag is UT's audio production house. It was started by Robert Quigley, and generally we're most famous for our true crime podcasts. I don't know if any of y'all have heard our recent work about the Austin bomber um, in our new season of Darkness, or our very first podcast ever, The Orange Tree, which talks about the, work, the murder of Jennifer Cave, um, a student in the West Campus area. But we're not just all about murder. We also cover things like internet politics with requests pending. Um, we do children's stories and storytelling for kids through Story Submarine. And finally, one of my very favorite podcasts of ours, um, we do a travel podcast called 35, which talks about all of the interesting things that you can see going up and down the Texas highway of I-35. And my very th favorite thing about working at the drag is that it's all done by people from UT. So it's either professors, alumni, or primarily, it's undergraduate students, which has turned out to be amazing for me, for one, um, because it's allowed me to expand my world as a long-form journalist. Um, and on top of that, I believe that it brings a really interesting perspective to these things, especially when we're talking about climate change. So that leads me to more of my personal journey as a climate reporter. So starting out in the spring of 2021, I had never done any environmental reporting, any science reporting, and especially no reporting on climate change. I was just an audio producer who had decided to apply for a position that I thought that at the time I was unqualified for. And I had some pretty weird ideas about what climate change meant for me and my future. Being a young person today, you see a lot of messaging regarding, to put it lightly, 
the end of the world and climate change. So it was hard for me to be able to get into it as a form of reporting because just thinking about it devastated me. So when I started reporting in the spring of 2020, 2021, sorry, um, I was very worried about what I was going to find um, and worried about how I was going to take it with my own mental health. Um, but surprisingly, through working on this project, I have found I have found hope in the changes that we're going to be seeing, and more importantly, hope in the people that I've interviewed and that I've worked with. Um, so a big part of this has been finding examples of extreme weather and climate change in my own backyard. I lived in Austin during the winter storm, and that was a pretty devastating experience for me. I lost power. Um, everyone I knew essentially lost power, and like I said before, many Texans found this as the first time that they really lost faith in their infrastructure, and I say that being one of them. And so going into the spring of 21, 21 and starting reporting, I was really worried about what I was going to find there. However, through my own reporting and looking back at the events that we've seen in the past 10, year, 10 years or so, I found that there were other examples of climate change in my own backyard. Like I said, I'm from Bastrop County, and I had just moved there in 2011 when the Bastrop fires occurred. And so going in and unpacking the ways that climate change had already impacted my own life, and more surprisingly, that I had survived the impact of climate change in my own life, gave me hope for the changes that we're going to see. In addition to that, just talking about the resilience of Texans and the ways that ordinary people who don't know that they're part of the battle against the climate crisis have stepped up to the plate and helped their neighbors and helped their friends has been an absolute revelation to me and has helped me combat my own climate doom, a theme that we're exploring very heavily in the podcast. This is why I think it's so important that this story is told this way. I don't think that there's anything more intimate than having somebody's voice in your ear telling them a personal story. It's been really, really wonderful for me to go ahead and start exploring this through this medium because we are seeing so many personal stories um, and it's allowed people to tell the story in their own words. I really think that using podcasting as the medium for this story helps to humanize complex issues and it's just regular folks talking to regular folks. There's no... Sorry. Um, there's no doubt that climate change is already impacting us. The only question that we have now is what story are we going to tell about those impacts? And I'm so happy to, to be joining Planet Texas 2050 in telling that story. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining, me, joining me today. Uh, my name is Bing Han. Uh, I'm uh, currently fourth year PhD candidate at the Sustainable Systems Program uh, in Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering Department at UT. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Texas Future's virtual reality experience. So uh, please don't read. It's not meant, meant for read. It's just the, <laughs> all, all the information I gather. So, I, I, I believe uh, sustainability and resilience is important. I don't need to spend a long time to convince you all. But uh, so when, I, when our program start, uh, we realized that there are already many great sustainability and resilience work. Many of them uh, created by PD2050, created by you all. Thank you very much for that. But the problem, the, the challenge we find is that many uh, general, general public will benefit from this knowledge, this great research results that you all created. But the problem is, it's hard for them to access them, right? When I Google sustainability done by UT, done by uh, uh, happening in this campus, this is what I found, right? 
uh, web pages, uh, master plans, journal articles, uh, great report uh, I read for 100 pages. I, I don't know how many, how many general public would read, and my guess is not many. So this is a challenge. We have all this great work. Many people can benefit from it, but they just lack, a, lack, a, lack, a ex, lack access to them. Therefore, we propose our solution, virtual reality. Uh, it, this is a technology that immerses a user in a virtual environment, either using a head-mount display or using a cave. Um, this technology has been used in many uh, uh, educational training situations, uh, like in my specialty construction, in different engineering, in medicine. It has been used in many situations for uh, training purposes, for uh, educa educational purposes. Therefore, we, want, we put together a team and we want to um, tra uh, transfer sustainability research into a pedagogical and at the same time entertaining virtual reality experience. So eventually this is, sorry. Let me see how to play this. I see the mouse here, play. Yeah. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a video about, um, about our VR experience. Uh, it, uh, the fact that uh, it's not playing is even better because we have a VR demo, <laughs> right? Uh, after this session, 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. today, 2, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. tomorrow, uh, right across the hall uh, at room 1.302E. Uh, so you are more than welcome to join me. I, I'm running the VR demo. You, you will experience uh, all, all of you will, you will experience everything we developed. Uh, but basically, we used uh, oh that, that's great. Basically, we put uh, <laughs> we put users into a futuristic uh, research lab. We use a puzzle game to help them understand the interconnections between uh, key resources in sustainability research. So here you can see we use uh, a three D um, animation to show the concept of uh, imperviousness surf surface, uh, surface imperviousness, and the users connects related uh, resources, we, uh, key resources in this research. We gave them correct uh, answers and use a video to uh, explain why those, uh, factor, uh, why those resources are important. We created an interactive uh, Texas map thanks to uh, Texas Metro uh, Ob Observatory project. We leverage their research data. Using this map, the users can uh, intuitively visualize a population growth trend. They will understand uh, current water consumptions and under different water conservation strategies, um, what, uh, what future water consumptions uh, will be. So uh, we didn't create, create this uh, data, but uh, our contribution is more about visualizing this data to make people uh, understand what, what's happening, what's next, why they, why they want to uh, be, be, be part of this, uh, this research. So uh, here's our team. We are composed of, uh, we, are, we have an interdisciplinary team composed of engineers, uh, scientists, and artists. Uh, together we put, uh, we, we uh, assembled this VR experience and we want to test the performance of this uh, VR experience. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, COVID, we cannot test this in, a, in public affairs. So uh, we just, we, we sent out uh, this VR experience to uh, whoever already have a VR, se uh, VR setup in their office or home, and results show that our VR experience provide about the right amount of uh, uh, knowledge and uh, knowledge depth. Uh, our experience uh, help them understand the concept better, uh, arouses their uh, curiosity on related topics. Okay, so um, this is more about uh, what the demo will like. You will see the uh, whole experience if you join me uh, three to five across the hall. Thank you very much.
Too many things to carry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can put that in your pocket as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll do the uh, clip. OK. Um, hello, everyone. I am Brendan Allison. I'm a second year PhD student in the EEB program. Um, I'm also part of the Resilient uh, e Species and Ecosystems Flagship, or RISE for short. Um, so we're going to do some exciting talk about DIY sensing, the future of ecological resilience in Texas, lots of fancy stuff. But before we do that, I wanted us to all think of an old ash juniper tree. And you see some pictures there. Uh, the distinguishing feature of an ash juniper tree that, is reached, that has reached maturity is not its height or width, although they can be very large, but its bark. And they peel off in these fibrous strips. Um, and golden cheek warblers that you see there in the middle, they take advantage of that. They peel off these strips and they build their nests. And that's why you can only have golden cheek warblers where you have ash juniper. Uh, but the really old ash junipers, you don't see much of. So you'll see some of them, some like somewhat old ash junipers around here, but the really old ones look more like this. One of the 20th century stories of Texas is the conversion of all these old stands of ash juniper and other hardwoods into fence posts and ranches, which now have forage crops. Uh, the thing about that is that metaphorically and literally, Texas through the present day is increasingly a state of fence posts. So we are fragmenting our landscape. Large old ranches are fragmenting into ranchettes. And um, besides that, of course, we have urbanization. Rural areas are being paved over, um, converted into suburb and city. Uh, global climate change is making Texas hotter, colder, wetter, and drier all at once. So one of the ways that could happen is that as heat bakes moisture out of the, the soil, things get drier. At the same time, heat is pulling moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico. So you're, you combine terrible droughts with torrential rain. Um, so you have flooding, you have drought. Um, things are getting a little bit more chaotic. Chaotic uh, is not always good. <laughs> uh, so Texas is in some ways becoming unrecognizable. But of course, the story of Texas has long been one of people complaining about the change that they are themselves part of. So that quote is one historic example. Back in 1861, a self-trained naturalist named Gideon Lincecum complained about the destructive tramp of immigration as all the world and the rest of mankind are coming to Texas. So today we hear that about Californians mostly. Uh, uh, but they could also be, they could miss things in their own biases like it would be great if we knew more about traditional Native American practices because the landscapes that people often took to be pristine, um, like a state of nature had actually resulted from generations of ecological management by the Native American communities here. So they missed a lot, but they could also be perceptive, like one of the things that they complained about were the new ranchers. They would essentially pull up all the native grasses um, and replace it with forage crops from the eastern US or from old Europe, um, even though they were worse adapted to the soil here. So part of the story of rise is using large scale, actually let me go back quickly, using large scale sensing uh, in order to understand what is between our feet, be, or beneath our feet, singing in the branches, golden cheek warblers, our uh, plant and animal communities, bringing a modern sensing approach in order to try to just pay attention, analyze, understand, and from there build resilience. Uh, so, Last, last thing on this slide is this is the threat, I think, posed by urbanization. Uh, this is an infographic put together by the New York Times, in collaboration with some researchers, showing where biodiversity is most threatened. And you can really see we're, we're a big part of that story here in Austin. Um, so with that said, let's think again about our juniper, our golden cheek warbler building its nest. If we were to put just one microphone out there, uh, we can learn a lot. We can learn um, not just in real time, but continuously day after day. By a mid-season shift in the type of song that it sings, you can actually tell 
if it has successfully breeded, because they tend to shift from A song to B song. Uh, you can tease apart the impact of anthropogenic noise by seeing how the song rates or the frequency that they're singing at may or may not be shifting in response to that noise or human activity. Uh, you can even, if you calibrate to typical call rates, uh, come up with a rough population density survey just from being able to listen with a single microphone. Uh, if you put out temperature, humidity, other environmental sensors out there, uh, you can do a lot more. You could start asking questions about Texas freezes that are coming late or intense heat waves that are coming early and the impact that that can have on animal populations. We don't actually have to limit ourselves just to uh, birds that you can hear or animals that you can hear. You can collect environmental DNA. You can start, there was actually a study in Copenhagen. They put DNA uh, HVAC filter and a fan and that was enough to be able to like, collect enough DNA to recover all the residents of the zoo, which is really amazing. So we're hoping to be able to do something like that in our project. Uh, lastly, we're really hoping to uh, democratize our data, which we're gonna talk about more in a second. Um, where we are, are at right now is that we're trying to prototype everything. So this is our current sensor build, and you can see it's actually a pretty simple idea. Basically, all you need to start is a weatherproof box and a Raspberry Pi brain. And that's on purpose. One of the goals is accessibility. Uh, you stick a bunch of sensors in, and you can start paying attention to the world around you in a way that you never could. Like a field study goes for so much time, but then you have to go home and sleep. But if you can have sensors out there, you can, be, uh, you can just be monitoring. And, and you can do it at multiple sites. It's great. Uh, there are also, uh, there's a lot of science, a lot of hard work to do. Uh, we'll gloss over the hard work. It's all good, good stuff right now. Um, I'll mention there are privacy issues, like one of our undergraduates is working on a project where they can apply voice activity detection to our acoustic data and then remove that. So um, there are a lot of projects within our project that are really cool. Uh, there's also a value system that goes into our design. A basic principle behind the project is the democratization both of data access but also of data generation. So from the start, we've had a great team of undergraduates, a few of them are there, um, who have played really a core role in the design. Um, they've, this project is as much theirs as ours. Uh, in turn, what we want is a simple and streamlined product that can be built by schools, community groups, um, different people who are interested in partnering. It doesn't have to be our exact design. Uh, the, the nice thing about these sort of platforms is you can swap out one sensor for another. If someone is interested in pollution, stick on a pollution sensor. So you can really be flexible. You can partner with a lot of people. Uh, so this semester, we're gonna deploy our first field prototype probably in Brackenridge Field Lab Laboratory. From there, we're hoping to really go throughout Rio Grande Valley um, and Central Texas. Uh, so just to wrap up, for better or for worse, Texas is in the midst of a giant natural experiment. So much is changing. The best time to start building something like this is yesterday. Uh, second best time is today. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Michael Shensky. I am the GIS and Geospatial Data Coordinator for the UT Libraries. I'm really glad to be here today to talk to you about a project uh, that I have been working on for the last several years, along with uh, Dr. Catherine Brown and a much larger research team uh, that you'll see a mention on the acknowledgement slides. And I want to talk to you today about the, this project where we have been studying um, uh, how we can use geospatial models in order to assess the risk of infectious diseases emerging in new environments and really focusing here on Texas as uh, you know, this environment that we want to uh, have a better understanding of and uh, 
look at how changing uh, environmental conditions, like we, we just heard about, might affect uh, species like the golden cheek warbler, how that might affect species that maybe we're not as excited about, things like kissing bugs that can transmit disease or um, pathogenic uh, bacteria that lives in our soils. All right, so uh, really the, this project came out of the idea that we can use geospatial modeling to get a better understanding of um, uh, really you know, where species can survive, specifically species that can cause disease. So we wanted to get a better understanding of where uh, these uh, pathogenic organisms that can infect us and make us sick, or the disease uh, um, carrying vectors like bugs uh, that can bite us and, and transmit uh, parasites or bacteria, where do these species live? And what is the environmental range of conditions that they can tolerate? Uh, how hot can it be before you know, these species can no longer live in a certain environment? How cold can it be before they can no longer live in an environment? So we're looking at climate conditions, like uh, those I just mentioned. We're also looking at soil conditions, uh, because some of the um, organisms we want to study are very dependent on those soil conditions. So soil pH, for instance, is it acidic or is it basic soil? Um, things like that. Um, and we wanted to look at how the habitat range of these species um, that should be a, of concern for us, um, how that overlaps with areas um, where we are actually at potential risk of acquiring disease. So just because a species happens to be there that can make us sick doesn't necessarily mean maybe that we're, we're interacting with that species much. Um, but in other cases, maybe we are. So um, it, it also will, will depend on human activity, human population uh, in the region where these species live. And uh, as we've just uh, heard about earlier today, uh, environmental conditions are changing. So the range uh, of these species can also change over time. So are they going to be able to appear in new places, um, uh, both here in Texas and potentially in other places in the world where we haven't seen them before? And that will affect where diseases will start to appear. If these organisms move into those areas, now humans might be at risk of getting sick from things that previously in that area uh, they didn't have to worry about. And so if we know where the, the risk of disease is changing um, and we're at uh, an increased risk of encountering a potentially uh, a deadly organism or an organism that can make us sick, we can uh, educate doctors, we can have them uh, testing and monitoring for um, conditions that maybe they haven't looked for in the past. So that's really the goal of this project. And actually, if I go back here for a second, um, we see some of the, the specific diseases that we're studying, uh, meliodosis down there represented by that uh, image of bacteria. Uh, we also are looking at Chagas disease, which is a, 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 a disease caused by a parasite that's spread by uh, the kissing bug. Uh, this uh, particular disease is here in Texas. Um, uh, these bugs do live uh, in the local environment uh, here uh, in central Texas. So uh, this is something we do have to be worried about, but is that risk going to change over time? Uh, and then with uh, meliodosis, this is a disease caused by a soil-dwelling uh, uh, bacteria, and it's something that we are concerned about potentially being able to uh, survive in the soils in Texas, but we, we don't know um, if it uh, is here yet or if it will be able to survive. So we have been collecting data for environmental conditions, um, data that, that's at the global level that will tell us um, how much rain falls across all areas of the world. What is the, the highest maximum temperature over uh, all areas of the world? What is the coldest minimum temperature annually in all areas of the world? Uh, what are the soil conditions like all over the world? Soil pH, uh, percent uh, clay or sand in the soil. Um, those types of conditions that will affect where certain organisms can survive. So we've gathered all this data. We've also gathered information about where these uh, species of concern have been identified in the past. So we know where they live. Uh, we can also then compare that to the environmental data we have, and we can figure out what conditions they can tolerate. So we can say, maybe, um, that the uh, lowest annual mean temperature that Burkholderia pseudomeliae, the uh, bacteria that causes meliodosis, the lowest annual mean temperature it can tolerate is 14.1 degrees Celsius, but based on all the observations we have of this organism. So if it's any lower than that um, in a particular area, we might be able to then assume that the bacteria cannot survive there. So in order to actually carry out this analysis, we've been using Python and QGIS specifically. Uh, QGIS is a mapping software that we can use to analyze the data. We've been using Python to write scripts that will um, utilize uh, the, the libraries of code uh, written for QGIS in order to help us carry out this analysis. And what we're basically doing is going through all of these different uh, variables that are listed here, annual mean temperature, annual precipitation, uh, precipitation of wettest month, I won't name them all, soil pH, absolute depth to bedrock, uh, these factors that we are um, uh, concerned about because they affect whether these species can survive. And then we are looking at all areas of the world to determine if 
all of these conditions are met. Is it between this value and this value? Is it between this value and this value? And if it's between the range of all of these values, we can conclude that the conditions in that area are suitable for survival of uh, you know, whatever organism we happen to be studying. We've created our model such that we can plug in different uh, occurrence data for different species and control the environmental factors we're looking at so we can study d different diseases with the same model. Uh, and so what we're seeing here are two different maps of where we think um, uh, there's a potential risk for meliodosis, where we think the organism that causes it might be able to survive. And you see these maps are different, even though it was the same model that produced them and it's the same disease that we're studying. The, the difference here is what data we're plugging in. Um, because the data for this particular bacteria dates back um, over 100 years, uh, we're a little concerned about the uh, accuracy or reliability of some of these older data points. And so we need to um, you know, exercise caution when we're plugging in data because even one um, erroneous data point can really dramatically affect the results of the model. And so we're trying to find ways um, to, to deal with those potential issues. Uh, just last year, the importance of this research was really highlighted when there was an outbreak of meliodosis in the United States. Four people uh, became seriously ill and several of them died. And it was due to uh, an imported product coming from India where uh, this um, disease is much more common and the bacteria is more present in the soils. And it was introduced into the United States. Uh, people got sick by spraying this contaminated product in their house. It was a house um, uh, uh, perfume spray, and uh, these people got sick, several of them died, and uh, it was sold throughout the United States at Walmarts that we see represented here as blue dots on the map. So we are concerned that you know, this bacteria may have been introduced into the soils here in the United States, and if we look at our, the results of our model, we see these are the areas uh, in the dark red where we think it might be able to survive uh, given the environmental conditions uh, in those parts of the United States. So there's a whole bunch of next steps here. Oh, there's plenty of other things for us to do. We want to um, improve the, the ability of the model to accommodate other organisms. Uh, we want to integrate with flood models uh, so that we can assess the change in risk. So if a bacteria maybe can survive in an area, um, maybe we're not at you know, much risk of running into it in our day-to-day -day activities, but if there's a big flood, maybe all of a sudden we're you know, uh, tromping through floodwaters and now we are at risk of encountering that bacteria. That will affect our risk of getting sick. We also want to look at future uh, climate data, looking at climate models to see how things will change in the future. We want to uh, try and detect outlier values to, to get a better understanding of which data points might be throwing off our model uh, results. We also want to create an interactive atlas to make the, the maps we're producing with this model easier to, to read and access. And we want to incorporate social vulnerability data to get a better understanding of where people are at risk of actually encountering um, these uh, organisms. So if you have any questions, I'd love to talk to you uh, afterwards. And uh, I want to thank uh, everybody that's been involved in this project, uh, Jessica Trologan, Suzanne Pierce, uh, Teresa Faria Arroyo, um, and Planet Texas 2050 for funding this work. Thank you. My name is Gabrielle Lee, and I'm a first year PhD student in sustainable system at the um, Department of Civil Engineering. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, circular economy in water systems. <coughs> so the global water demand is expected to exceed uh, viable resources by 40% by 20, 2030. So that means we are now facing the water crisis. But how does this happen? <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> One of the reasons behind this is that water has been pushed into a linear model, which is um, economically and environmentally unsustainable. So as you can see on the left-hand side, a traditional linear model <coughs> follows a take, use, and dispose pattern. So when water travels through the system, it becomes even more polluted, so it is difficult to access um, safe potable water. So to mitigate the water shortage, it is important to create a circular model that is promising for repeated use of water. So um, as you can see uh, on the right hand side, um, a circular uh, water model is um, uh, <clears throat> can reduce water consumption by recycling and reusing it. So it's a solution to um, mitigate the water shortage. So um, we decided to look for real world cases that implement in circular economy principles in water systems. 
So um, the figure on the left hand side shows that there are multiple types of water systems, whether it's um, centralized water systems or distributed water systems. While a centralized water system can serve more people and satisfy higher demands, it also requires higher budget capital investment to, um, to build it, and it, it also takes longer to build. Uh, on the other hand, a distributed water system <coughs> um, is easier to install and require less budget. Therefore, uh, we decided to focus on um, distributed water system to be implemented at a community scale. So this um, led to my research question. So what are the criteria for uh, selecting an appropriate circular economy, uh, circular water strategy to be adopted in a community? And what is the relative weight for each criterion? So to answer these two questions, um, the purpose of um, our study is to identify and prioritize the selection criteria for uh, the most appropriate circular water strategy. So um, for the research methodology, we started from conducting a literature review to investigate common practices of <coughs> uh, at a community scale around the globe. And then we um, identify key factors that need to be taken into consideration when planning for uh, implementation. Then we use a technique called um, the fuzzy Delphi method and um, to collect experts' opinion to um, eliminate those important factors. So um, we collected 17 criteria by reviewing the literature and six of them were eliminated based on the survey result. And then we used the fuzzy analytical hierarchy process to um, obtain the relative weight of each criteria, uh, of each, each criterion. And um, the survey is still ongoing and we are looking forward to seeing the results. And um, we hope that in the future, the result can be um, apply to assist in the decision-making process, and um, the research method that we, we use can be further applied to other systems, such as food and energy systems. So that's all I have for today. Thank you so much. All right, so my name is uh, Eirik. I'm a research associate at the Odin Institute. Uh, I'm working with uh, Michael. He gave a talk a few, few people back, and uh, I have a couple of students as well giving uh, posters tomorrow and uh, Thursday. So I'll talk to you uh, primarily today about a case study that we've done uh, over the last year and a half, uh, which is uh, done by myself, Mark Loveland, another PhD student, and Clint Dawson, uh, my supervisor, and Ed Buskey, who's a marine biologist uh, at UT Austin Marine Science Institute, which is in Port Aransas, Texas, not in Austin. And uh, I will, since I only have seven slides, I will acknowledge him and uh, the Marine Science Institute for actually funding this research and also TAC for the resources, uh, computational resources. So the area that we study is uh, down in Corpus Christi, which is uh, right here in South Texas, and in particular, we're interested in this part of the coast right here near the Aransas Pass, and the Aransas Pass in particular, uh, because this channel that goes from the coast all the way to Corpus Christi is man-made. It's not natural. It's uh, dredged by the Army Corps currently to 47 feet, but uh, to accommodate even larger oil tankers, uh, they want to make it about 50% more at 70 feet. Uh, a little more is what I heard this last weekend. Uh, now. Behind this pass, there's Corpus Christi Bay, there's Redfish Bay, and Aransas Bay, and these are critical habitats for uh, many fish, but in particular, a fish called red drum. 
uh, and the red drum, they spawn offshore and then tides and winds and whatnot will take the fish larvae that just float on top of the water into this bay system and hopefully they settle in one of these four areas that I've highlighted because the water is shallow and they can uh, evolve into fish. And the, air, the time of the year that they spawn is in the fall. So what we do is we build a numerical model uh, for the circulation of the Gulf of Mexico and the entire North Atlantic uh, coast uh, and the ocean off of the coast, uh, which is called the ADSERC model that we developed. Uh, we then uh, find weather data from the national, uh, the North American mesoscale model uh, for 60 day periods in the fall, September through October. Uh, and we consider three specific years, 2011, 2012, and 19. Uh, 12 was the drought of record and 2019 and 11 are as close to an average year as you can get with the current data. Uh, we compute the circulation of the seawater. We validate this model. I will not have time to show you that, but our model is very, very accurate. Then in the, into these models that we develop, we throw in particles that uh, mimic uh, fish larvae. We call them Lagrangian particles because they live in a Lagrangian reference frame. And these particles will then be tracked uh, throughout uh, the 60 days that we consider um, due to the circulation of the seawater. Uh, and we will then count and monitor the number of larvae that enter these four uh, boxes that I showed you before. And the reason we work with Ed on this is because he's a marine biologist, so he knows uh, where the fish spawn. So as I said, the model we build covers actually the entire Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. The reason is that the 60-day time period that we consider, you're guaranteed on the Texas coast to have a hurricane, and the hurricanes are definitely affected by winds and tides and whatever happens far away. So they need to be very, very large, these models. Uh, so out here, the resolution of our model is maybe 15, 20 kilometers, but when we zoom into the Aransas Pass, you can see these little triangles, it might be a little hard, they're on the order of meter, meters. So this model is very, very highly refined, and we also use it operationally for hurricane storm surge forecasting every year. So uh, on the left here, we see the initial conditions of uh, red drum larva, these, these two black lines. Uh, actually, they're 2,400 uh, or so uh, particles, fish larva, uh, and we built two models, one for the current channel and one for the deeper channel that's been proposed. And we just count the particles that reach these four areas that are in the back here. Uh, they're not on this figure, but I showed them to you before. So 2011, 12, and 19, we can see that there is actually, for this particular case, very little change. 2011, slight decrease, and 12 and 19, we see a very slight increase in number of successful uh, fish larvae. If we double the number of particles, we add these two lines here. Uh, not only do we get more successful particles, but the, the fraction of successful actually doubles as well. Uh, and again, there's very, very little difference uh, to ascertain between the, the future uh, and the current case. And then the final last case, which is a slightly different distribution of fish larva, we again see a very similar trend that in some instances, we have a slight reduction, and in other cases, we have a slight uh, increase. Um, but overall, if we sum all these numbers together, for 2011, we see a decrease of less than 1%, and for the two years, we see almost 1.5% uh, higher success rate for the fish. So it might actually be positive net for especially this uh, type of uh, fish larva. Um, Currently, we're looking at the effect of this deeper channel onto hurricane storm surge. That's the ongoing project. Uh, we have a paper on this. If you uh, search fish particles, Port Aransas, you'll probably find uh, the paper. It's free online. You can read it if you're interested. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Probably don't need this, but thank you everyone so much for your presentations. Um, I hope those of you who are less familiar with Planet Texas 2050 have now gotten an idea of the depth and breadth and interdisciplinarity of the projects that are part of Planet Texas and associated with Planet Texas. 
Up next is our Resilience Cafe. Again, that is a on-brand, cute way of saying Q&A. So we would love for all of you to join us out on the patio, take some time to talk to the presenters, ask questions of each other. Um, representatives of our research teams are here. I see Dr. Tim Kitt, Fernando Lecce, Adam Rabinowitz, a few other people will be in here. Oh, I'm of course here. Um, speak to each other, get to know each other more, enjoy some coffee, tea, and pastries. Tomorrow, we kick off the day at noon um, with a resilience roundtable, a panel discussion on cultural memory and equity planning. That is going to be in this room, um, streamed live, um, and also available on Zoom if you want to tune in virtually. And then we have a poster session tomorrow afternoon, um, followed by a talk that's co-presented with the Rappaport Center over at the law school um, on, uh, uh, Fernando, what is the judge's name? Antonio Benjamin, who is a, essentially a supreme of the Supreme Court of Brazil um, and a longtime leader in environmental law. That'll be at four o'clock, and then tomorrow evening at seven at Austin Film Society Cinema, we are screening um, an unreleased film. It's only the third time it's been shown in the U.S. called Southwind. Um, so we hope that y'all can join us for parts of the day or all of the day tomorrow, and then we'll be back here on Thursday to conclude. Thank you.